Kelsey Zeiser, and we're here at Fiber Connect in Nashville, and I'm joined by Kevin Morgan with Clearfield. Good to see you. It's great to be here. Yeah. Nice to see you too. Are you enjoying the conference so far? It's been great. Yeah, it's uh, opening day. You know, this is the day we, we plan for years in advance, but uh, it's been a great day. We had a great pre-conference yesterday, but today has been phenomenal. Yeah, it's, it's been a while since I've gotten used to like so many people in, in one space just with COVID and everything. Oh yeah, you know, <laughs> last, we, we, we were fortunate last year that we opened up when COVID was at a lull. Right. And yeah. then right after that conference, it, it, it kind of had an outbreak, but uh, we've been very fortunate this year to have stability yeah. and be able to have everyone coming out. Yeah, really good turnout. Uh, so tell me a little bit about the uh, acquisition with Nestor Cables. Yeah. How is that a good strategic move for Clearfield? So Nestor Cables has been one of the suppliers for, for many years to Clearfield for our field chill product line. And so we were able to get to know them over a number of years. They worked with us um, in designing and building many of those field chill uh, varieties of cable. And so we were able to understand their business model as we had more and more business. In any business, there's opportunities to potentially vertically integrate, and that's what we did. We looked at this as a vertical integration of that business. Um, their business, they're based out of Finland, uh, have been around since 2007. We formed in 2008, so we're fairly you know, close in, uh, in age but uh, they have about 30% of their business exports out of Finland, and we're a big part of that. So um, it gives us an opportunity to understand a little bit more about their product technology and bringing it into the North American market. We have plans to bring it into our T1 of Exco uh, production facility to satisfy the demand for drop cables as we see that ramping up in the next few years. Excellent, yeah, we'll have to keep an eye on that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what are you hearing from your customers in terms of uh, you know what they're looking forward to with the BEAT and, and Middle Mile funding? Um, what, are, what are their plans? <laughs> yeah, so May 13th of 2022 was a really big day. Um, we were able to understand not only the um, the scope of the program, the 42.5 billion for the deployment, plus all the other stuff for tribal, middle mile, digital equity. But we understood the rules of, of what, how you were able to go out and get the money as an eligible entity of the states and territories. We knew this was coming as a result of the legislation that passed six months earlier. So it wasn't like a big surprise. The surprise and, the, and I think the aha moment for the industry was that the rules favored fiber. Um, I mean, it hits our sweet spot at Clearfield. So we're really happy about it. Yeah. Um, and there are phrases sprinkled throughout the notice of funding opportunity rules that talk about favoring end-to-end -end fiber connectivity and how important it is as an infrastructure to lay the groundwork for not only uh, the, the broadband connectivity to your home, but also for 5G, right. which depends on fiber networks. And so I believe that this, um, this legislation is meant to be providing infrastructure. And I heard this morning one of our keynote speakers, uh, Andy Burke, talk about how that it's an opportunity for taxpayers to get a re real return on their investment. It won't just be a, a, a speed, 25 meg, 100 meg, whatever. This is infrastructure bill. And so fiber is infrastructure. And so it's very, very encouraging to see that. And I believe that our customers, our service provider customers, are, are really lined up well uh, to take advantage of that through the state you know, governments. Yeah, and that'll be really beneficial for years to come and as applications yeah. get more bandwidth hungry. You know, it, it, fiber deployment's been going on for 20 years, but we still have the unserved population. And if you look across uh, how, how much is unserved, there's about a 17% gap in the rural areas alone that don't have access to 25 meg down and three megabit up. In an urban area, that's 1%. So we're really talking about this This bill and this NOFO and this B that is going after those areas that are high, hard to serve. You know, they didn't make the business case on the first go round right. or second go round. These are the hard to serve areas. So um, I think it's gonna be a really, a big boon for the entire economy, uh, create jobs for labor, as well as create infrastructure for those that need it the most out in the rural areas. Uh, and what are your 
your thoughts on uh, some of the smaller service providers and local municipalities that you work with? Are they well suited to uh, kind of further that broadband experience? Yeah, so it used to be an issue um, that if I was wanting to roll out a fiber network, I had to have very high skilled staff and technicians and, and people in, in the know to understand how to really deploy fiber networks. The benefit right now in 2022 for the newcomers coming on board that are interested in rolling out fiber, it doesn't take as much as it used to. It's, I mean, we have technologies now that are, uh, we call it labor-like technologies at Clearfield. We can, you can design a product so that you can use a plug and play system. So we've had customer service provider customers that would be similar to what the utilities, municipalities, let's go off would be new to fiber, come in and train people that are good with their hands, mechanics, uh, people that are landscapers, people that want to get a different career path. Train them in a half a day and they're able to understand how to put together a plug and play network. They don't have to be you know, well versed in, in fiber splicing. You can put together an entire network without splicing. So that's, that's where we're at today. So I think at this time, the, the inexperienced service providers that are benefit to be able to take advantage of kind of the second, third wave of generations of products that have gone on before them. Yeah, for those who yeah. figured it out, maybe. In yeah, a we, we bled on that hill, and, right? right? <laughs> we really did. I already got that covered. Um, so I, I was attending a session earlier today, and there was some discussion about uh, the open access delivery model. What are your thoughts on that? I think open access has its place. Uh -huh. Um, and we see this uh, employed mostly for the mi municipal owned utilities. I mean, Huntsville Utilities comes to mind for me. Um, uh, we, and that's a success model that I think is working, where you can have utility that have access to the right of way that they need, the bucket trucks and all that, build out the infrastructure, then have service providers come in and sell services over that infrastructure. It makes sense. Uh, is it perfect? No. Um, I sat in on a session yesterday on Mon County, Virginia, oh, West Virginia, excuse me. And they have a model where the county government's working to have a public-private partnership and have multiple carriers on their system. Do they want to own the network? No. They want to have someone else own that customer connection, the customer network. But they're willing to invest in order to help their citizens. So I think that's the theme that I'm hearing. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And um, I've love that phrase one throat to choke but it, yeah. it seems like that would um, you know who do, who do you go to when the <laughs> when there's problems with the network yeah, and ultimately who's going to be responsible and, ultimately there's yeah. someone that built the network that yeah. will be responsible yeah yeah uh, so uh, are there any other trends that Clearfields uh, looking forward to with um, fiber deployments expanding both in the US and you know we talked about your the Finland yeah, so, piece as well um, Fortunately, I think we're still in like the first, well, I mean, second or third inning of a long, you know, nine inning game. So there's a lot, to, lot to happen. We, uh, we are right now really focused on helping companies get uh, homes passed. That's that's what they're measured on. That's what they're telling Wall Street and uh, the larger companies. When you add it up, is multiple millions of homes passed in the next five years. There'll be more homes passed than the previous 20 combined. So let's get the homes passed. Then we have to get the homes connected. Right. So homes connected is going to be the next frontier. And you'll see a lot of innovation with homes connected that will lower the cost of that process. Uh, and I think that's what we're going to see in the next two, three, four years, uh, all, all that innovation hit the market. Yeah, sounds good. No. Well, thanks so much for your time. It's oh, been yeah. a pleasure. It's my pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you.